so now, I am who I am, Yahweh. Oh, that is very, very, very interesting. So what is amazing, we can ask a question. If I know the name of God, I need to understand what His name means. Because God says, I am what I am. And of course, your question can be, I am what? Who? So, to answer that question, because it's as if it is like a verb, that is a verb word, it is not, it's, it's got an open end. It's not finished. I am who I am. But God was actually telling Moses, your people, back in, in Egypt, I am Yahweh. They will find out who I am as I'm going to deal and work with them in time to come. They will discover who I am. Because what is amazing, you will find in the, uh, in the book of Exodus, uh, Numbers right through to Deuteronomy, you will find that God will reveal His name when He does something very special for them. Then He will reveal His name. So it becomes very, very interesting because if we know his names, we know who we are talking about. And it's actually frightening to think that a person can describe his character or an attribute about himself by just knowing his name. So how can a name be sufficient to describe God? So it's impossible. So we have to look at all the names. I mean, the Bible even says that the heavens cannot contain God. How can one name contain God? So, in the Old Testament, there are no specific references to Jesus Christ as the eternal Son of God or to Christ as the Word of God. You don't find it in the Old Testament. You, you'd find traces of the Trinity in the Old Testament, but you'll find no direct description of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit like that in the Old Testament, but you see it in the New Testament several times. So, it means that as the Bible progressed, that's why we talk about progressive revelation. In other words, God reveals something about himself, a little bit later, something more. A little bit later, something more. And eventually, we, we can understand a lot about him. But it takes time to, for God to reveal himself through the word. So in the New Testament, we have a lot of revelations of the name of Christ and of God that is new to us that we never knew in the Old Testament. So both Testaments uh, is to us a absolute revelation of who God is. So it is clear in the New Testament, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you don't find it in the Old Testament. Because in the Old Testament, it was about all the heathen nations with their false idols. So God would always say, your God, I'm God and I'm one. Because they've got all their idols. That's why Israel will stand very strong under the Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4 that says, Here Israel, your God is but one. Because he's the one only true God between all the other gods. And remember, people didn't know who God was. They don't know the names of God, all the Gentile nations. Only Israel had the true name of God. So you had to become a proselyte, uh, except Judaism, as your faith in the Old Testament to know who the true God is. Because God revealed himself through Israel who he is. So God first had to choose a man, then out of that man built a nation. Then as everything goes along, reveal himself who he is. Because through that nation, he will one day bring the Christ, the Messiah to the world. And he's a true son of God. To do all of that, God would use that nation to present his name to the world. But they run after idols themselves. Then God says, but you, you keep yourself up with fornication. I'm going to divorce you. And eventually, uh, God, I mean, God is a divorced God. In the book of Isaiah, God gave him a divorce letter. He says, I'm done with you. Get away from me. I want nothing to do with you. You will not be my wife anymore. So, I mean, God has divorced himself from Israel as a nation. He is a divorced God. Of course, at the end, he will be reunited to her, but at the moment, 
God is divorced. Jesus will have a wife one day, the church, because the church is a bride, and the bride one day will become his wife. But God will also have a wife, and God's wife will be Israel. But that will only be reinstated, the position, in future. But as of the moment, Jesus is not married, and Father is not married, because God has divorced from Israel his wife. He took her to be his wife. And Jesus, he only has a bride. And the bride will one day become his wife, but only after he come to fetch his bride. Then we can be the wife of the Lamb. Anyway, but that is for free. I will take up no offering. <laughs> I don't know why I'm telling you these things. But anyway, I think it's important to know it. It brings some it creates perspective of what we're talking about here. We talk about God and his name and how he revealed himself and through his names to his people, to Israel. It is very important. So you will read, there is only one God and his name is Lord, Yahweh. I am who I am. So of course we have seen that um, in the book of Exodus. But of course, this brings to us the question, how will we clearly see the name of God and understand and as it is revealed? So as we travel through the Old Testament now, I'm going to take you through a journey. I can make it as short as possible and to the point as far as I can. So the watershed moment, you will always remember, is that moment by the burning bush, right? Right. Because at that moment, God revealed profoundly His true name, Yahweh. So God has a name. His son is also a name. His son's name is Jesus. So when He said, but by my name, Lord, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to your forefathers. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they didn't know about this. But here's a remarkable thing at the burning bush. Because one of the things was, it was revealed. So when God revealed his name, his name, there was a few things that happened. Because it's very profound. The setting, everything. Like for instance, there was fire. There was fire when God revealed his true name. Which means there's holiness in the name. His name is holy because the holy God is a God of fire. And also the burning bush reveals the grace of God because at that moment God says, I heard the cries of my people. God hear people call on him. So there's holiness, there's grace, and also it is a place where God revealed that he knows Moses' name. Have you ever found in the Bible that God asks somebody, what is your name? Have you ever read it? God appears and he says, Gideon, or he appears, he says, Moses, or he appears, he says, Joshua. God never asks somebody, what's your name? He knows our name. He knows who you are. And so God said to Moses, Moses, he didn't say to him, who are you coming here to this burning bush? Take off your feet. Who are you? No. He said, Moses. Moses. Moses is like, ah! Oh, somebody knows my name. I thought I was alone. And so also, God informed Moses that Yahweh know the sorrow of his people. He said, I heard their cry. So Yahweh says, I can hear. I can see, I understand. And I'm going to greatly um, reveal myself to them so they can know where I am. So here's my question. Now, can we ask, may we ask, I am what? If God says, I am what I am, can't we ask him what? You understand? Thank you, Vessel. You understand if I say, God, Elohim, Lord, I am who I am. Can't I ask him and say, Yahweh, what? I am what? Because there must be an explanation to his name. The explanation that you find Yahweh, Rabba, and you can see it, and it happened, or like people will say, Rafa, Yahweh, 
Rapha will be the correct way to introduce it, was in Exodus chapter 15. Because a few chapters later, for the first time ever, when the people cried out to the Lord uh, because of the water that was bitter. So I read to you what happened there. It's just two verses explaining what God is actually saying, I am, I am what? Here comes the answer. Then Moses cried out to the Lord, to Yahweh, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. There the Lord, Yahweh, made the decree and a law for them, and there he tested them. Now God's going to show them something. If you listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring you uh, on you any of the diseases I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord, I am Yahweh, Rapha, for the first time ever, who heals you. From that very moment, Israel will understand that Yahweh can bring healing. For that reason, Jesus, of course, is Yahweh Rapha. He is the Lord that heals us. Because Peter and everybody told us in the epistles how he healed and the gospel writers. So Rapha actually means to stitch together, to repair, to attach, to bring healing. Actually, Yahweh, our physician. So, because God healed the water. Remember, he did the miracle. Yahweh, he called on Yahweh and said, Lord, we need water, we can't drink this water. And God said, throw a piece of wood in my name. So he chucked it there and the water was good. And God says, so from then on, he says, for I am, Moses, your people will learn. I am Yahweh Rapha. I will bring healing. Wow, that's something new. Never they knew that. So, and he did it by the bitter waters um, of, um, of Mara. So, because of that, we do understand the Bible says that Jesus Christ, he went around and he did healing and bring healing to all he went, all over the land of Israel, because God was with him. And of course, in 1 Peter 2, we read, through his wounds, you have been healed. So, of course, Jesus has power and authority over sickness and death. He changed water into wine. He healed the son of the royal official, the sick man at Bethesda. He healed the born blind. He raised Lazarus from the dead. Jesus did wonderful signs and healings. So Jesus, of course, we can call on him and say, Jesus, you are my healer. Or in our case, we would normally say, Jesus, our healer. And of course, from a Hebrew side, you could also say, Yahweh, Rafa, he's my healer. Of course we can ask, but what about the rest of his names? So not only Yahweh, Rafa, the Lord, my healer, like in Exodus revealed to us, but it will bring us to the next one. If you follow the line, the progression of how God reveals his name, the next one you will find will be Yahweh, Nasai. And Yahweh Nasai, you will find it in Exodus chapter 17. Two chapters later, they had another encounter. They were in a battle with the Amalekites. And they were having a hard time. And the Lord did not like the, uh, the, the Amalekites from that time onward. He said, there will always be war with you in the Amalekites. You know why? The Amalekites was a very devious nation. You know what they did? As Israel moved through the desert, the nation, guess who's behind? If we are one and a half, 1.8 million people traveling through a desert, who will stay behind? The old people, the children, the sick, those that can walk slowly, the old people, they're always behind, they're lagging behind. And the Amalekites would always come from the back and kill from behind. And the Lord said, they are your enemies for what they did. Because that was very wrong in my eyes. That was his strategy. And so from then on, there was a big battle because this day, Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with a sword. And now you read in Exodus chapter 17. Then Yahweh said to Moses, write this on a scroll 
God says, you need to write this down, Moses, as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it because I will completely blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. I will kill every one of them. Moses built an altar and called it the Lord Yahweh is my banner. Yahweh Messiah, which means for hands were lifted up to the throne of the Lord. Yahweh, the Lord, will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. So one of the meanings of Messiah will be God can see and he see afar off. He can clearly see. And so, and God has given the victory, a sign or a symbol. In other words, because we can see from afar, which means we will put up, we raise up a banner and we will say the Lord, Messiah, which means he is the victorious one. So he built an altar and they celebrated and gave God all the glory. So a banner in the olden days was not only a flag, it could be a shining thing on, a, uh, on top of a pole or a standard or a flag. But what it actually means, the Lord is lifted up on high and he will give us the victory. And of course, the Lord is my Messiah. He is my victory. And so from then on, they would always fight under that name, Yahweh Messiah. So in other words, what we know about Yahweh, he will fight our battles for us. I don't have to fight alone. Do you think it's, it is important for us to know that the Bible says that if Jesus Christ be for us, who can be against us? What about a text like, um, in him we are more than conquerors? Messiah? Or those who are born of God overcomes? Or those that through the blood of the Lamb overcome the devil? So in actually... Under the banner of Jesus Christ, because all authority is given to him. So me and you today, we know that Jesus can help us to fight our battles. We don't have to be alone. We can ask him to help us, because he fought the devil and sin, and he conquered everything. And of course, that brings me to the third one, and that is, I am Yahweh Mkadesh. So the Mkadesh. What would you understand under Mkadesh? Because it means to consecrate yourself to be holy. Because the Lord called on Israel and he said, if you want to follow me, if you want me to be your God, you need to be a holy people. But our understanding of holy is different than what Israel understood it in the Bible at that time. Because our understanding of holy sometimes is, uh, is very mixed up. It is, it's not correct. The word holy in its, um, uh, uh, in its deeper sense means it is consecrated. It means, um, uh, in, in, in a very deep sense, means to set apart. It belongs to. It belongs to someone. And in this instance, if it is the Lord, it means the Lord sanctifies people and they belong to Him. In other words, the moment that you go in the direction of Yahweh, Kadesh means we are set apart for Him. And you find that in the Old Testament with Israel 700 times. You are set apart of all the nations of the earth to belong to me. You are my priests and my kings and you belong to me. But of course, the moment they go astray and they follow other gods, God had to intervene. And God had to judge them. And God's wrath was poured over them. Instead of being the light of all the nations, they follow their gods. And that would anger the Lord, and then the Lord would depart from them. And then they will call on God, you are our God, and we bring sacrifices again. And then God turned back to them, and they repent of their sins. And then a judge helped them and bring them back on track and just to turn around again. That's why you find Gideon and you find Yafta and you find Sim, uh, Simson and many others. They would help them to bring them back on track only for a while and then they go off again. Then they want the king 
No, we don't want God to be our king. Look at all the nations. They have a king. We will also want a king. And the Lord says, but you are holy. You are separate. You belong to me. I'm your king. No, no, no. We want a king like all the nations. You know, crazy how they went about and what they did. But what is very interesting, I don't know if you know it, that you know that the word, Mkadesh, what is, what is really holy? A nation can be holy, a person can be holy, and things can be holy. Because it can be all set, up, be set apart for the Lord. Like for instance, what about the Sabbath day? The seventh day for old Israel under the law, it was holy, meaning it is separate of all the other days of a week. You can do from Sunday, the first day of the week, till Friday, the last day of the week. And by the way, I don't know if you know it. Did you know that no day in the Bible has got a name except the seventh day? You always read in your Bible, on the first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day. It's only got a number. But the Sabbath has got a name. The seventh day. It is a Sabbath. And the Sabbath day for old Israel was set apart under the law, it's not today for the church, because Jesus rose on the first day of the week. That's why we come together on Sundays, because that's the first day of the week. So it has to do with Israel and the law, that in, uh, anyway has been abolished by the Lord. But the point is, for them in Old Testament time, the Sabbath day was set apart. And the 50th year was a sabbatical year. So they had the days that were set apart for their feasts. Holy means it has been set apart for that purpose. That is about days. That we can find everywhere in the Old Testament. But when it gets to a feast, you will see in Le Leviticus chapter 23, my appointed feast, the feast of the Lord, and it is holy unto the Lord. It is the Lord's feast and they have to keep the feast. So if the Lord says it's time to be happy and to have a feast, you do what the Lord says. Of course, it's his feast. So it was set apart, literally. It is sacred. It's a sacred gathering. When it gets to set apart for places, it is like the Lord said to Moses, take off your shoes, you are now on holy ground. Now, that piece of ground in Midian where that burning bush was burning, it wasn't holy, it's just a piece of land. It's just out there in the wild desert, in the wilderness. But the moment the presence of God was there, that place became holy. You understand? The moment God's presence was manifest, it become holy. So, it will be with places. And, and so, not only days, but the temple. So, the temple become a holy place. Why? It has the presence of God. It was manifest first in the ark, uh, in the tabernacle, and then the presence of the Lord, the Shekinah glory, appeared in the temple. So, it become holy. But also people, and because the Lord said, above the head or in front of the head here of, uh, of uh, uh, Aaron, there must be a uh, plate and it must be holy unto the Lord. He is set apart. He's my high priest. So the priests were holy to the Lord. And even when the Lord called the prophet Jeremiah, he said, you have been set apart. And did you know that your tithe to the Lord's work is holy? Did you know that? Have you ever thought about it in your entire life? Because the Lord says in Leviticus chapter 27 verse 30, a tithe of everything from the land, from the grain, the soil, the fruit of the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Why are you now so quiet? Because it is set apart for God. It's not for you to use. It belongs to Him. So if you take, you can take it, you are very welcome. To him. I give you permission Take your tithe, keep it for yourself, but next month you have to add one-fifth to it. Yeah, Leviticus says, if you skip a tithe and you bring it back, you must add 20% to your tithe. Do you, do you want to pay 20% added to your tithe? You don't want to do that. Oh, you want to do it, okay. <laughs> no. So your tithe is holy to the Lord. But also, um, when, when we see even the high priest's bread was consecrated to the Lord, but because it belongs to the Lord, I can't take my tithe for myself. Now, getting to tithe, just something very interesting. 
So it's tithe under the law. No, no, no. There was tithe before the law. Abraham and Jacob and others paid, and you read it in the book of Genesis, before the law, they gave a tithe to the Lord. There was tithe under the law, like we see in the book of Leviticus, it was made part of the Jewish faith of Judaism in the, uh, the books of Moses. So it had to be done under the law. Then, after the law being abolished in the New Testament, in the, uh, uh, Hebrew chapter 7, because Jesus Christ is my high priest, you need to remember something. I want to show you something here. Thank you. So when you look here, and when you see the high priest, the question would be, if we talk about Jesus Christ being my high priest, my question to you would be, if you take the high priest into consideration, who is the high priest today? Whose high priest is Jesus? Your high priest. My high priest. Is he our high priest? Of course he is. Now, if Jesus is our high priest, where is his tithe? Because Melchizedek had received the tithe of Abraham. So the book of Hebrew very clearly, very clearly explained to us that our tithing is to our high priest Jesus Christ. How can he be your high priest in heaven and do the work of interceding and everything and he don't receive the tithe from you? It's going to be a terrible responsibility that you have to one day give account to. And since I've understood that um, 45 years ago, I never to this day ever skipped one month giving my tithe to the Lord. Not one month of my entire life. I'm not bragging about it. I'm just saying, once you understand, it's irrelevant what happens with the rest of my finances, but I will never take my high priest money away from him. Because that is sacred. It is holy. Because a tithe is holy. It belongs to holy Jesus. And it is holy unto the Lord. And I need to give to him what is due. I will never take away from him that is not due. Uh, I mean, for my, for my own sake, I can't take what I want. I first give him what is due to him. So it's very, very important. Once you have a relationship with the Lord, you get your ducks in a row and you sort yourself out. And eventually you will get to the place where you give God what belongs to him. I know people that give more than a tenth. I know people that give 60%, 70%, 80% of the income to God. Because they make a lot and they don't want it for themselves. They want to invest it in God's kingdom work. I know many people like that. But for us, as normal Christians, we have a responsibility. So even our tithe belongs to the Lord. Because it is holy unto the Lord, unto Yahweh. So because He is our holiness. But believers are holy. Did you know you are holy? Not because you have a sweet face and a smile on your face. But because you belong to Jesus Christ. And in that sense, you are set apart to Him. All believers are holy to the Lord. That you know that. Irrespective of their position in the kingdom. The Bible says that you are in Christ. Who become for us wisdom of God. And righteousness and holiness. Or like the word of God says. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world. To be holy and blameless in his sight. Now here's the big question. If I am holy to God. It means I am set apart for the Lord. If I am set apart to God, it means my body belongs to Him too. I can't only spiritually belong to Him. Everything belongs to Him. That's why the Bible says, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So now, my, if my tithe belongs to the Lord, if my heart belongs to the Lord, my body belongs to the Lord, I belong to Him. Well, it's wonderful to know that I belong to someone that will take care of me for the rest of eternity. And to love and serve Him. And so there's something very amazing in Romans 12 verse 1. When Paul says, I urge you, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing unto God. This is your spiritual act of worship. He says, the least you can do is to wake up in the morning and say, Lord, here I am, I'm yours. Use me for your glory today. I'm available, Lord. Do with me whatever you want. My mouth my tongue, my body. And like Peter would wrote, and he would say, just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in everything you do, because it is written, be holy because I am holy. So holy means set apart for that purpose. In closing, 
the believer should not be surprised if you suddenly are disciplined by the Father. Because he might find things that he does not like in your life. And how will he go about? So Hebrew 12 says, So moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. Is it true? That your father sought you out? Yep. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits? If my father, earthly father is my father because of my body. I was born because of him and my mother. I exist and now I'm born. And if he speaks, I need to listen and be subjected to him because he's my father. So now the argument is, if that is how you act against your father, what about your heavenly father? Because your spirit and your body actually belongs to him. So the argument of the writer of the book Hebrews is, our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. And let me tell you, they made many mistakes. I got a lot of hidings I should have never got in my life. My brother did it and it wasn't me. Right? He did something and he says, Raymond did it. And I'm like, no, 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 you did it. He says, no, he did it. Eventually, he gets hiding and I get hiding. And it wasn't me. Well, sometimes it was me, but I mean, I agree. But God disciplines us for our good. That we may share in his loneliness. So sometimes the Lord has to correct us a little bit. Pull us straight. And it's okay because we belong to him. He has something else in mind. So in closing, the father of glory calls a believer to set himself apart. This is an incredible portion of scripture where the Lord actually asks you to make the decision. And the decision that he wants you to make is a following in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Come out from amongst them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty, El Shaddai. I will take care of you. Huh? Since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfectly holiness out of reverence for God. So you should not be in a yoke with an unbeliever. You need to be very careful when you get involved in the lives of unbelievers because now you are yoked with them in something different. So you need to be very, very careful and really hear from the Lord. Otherwise, there will be very big consequences. Like, for instance, I would marry someone, and then I will tell the lady, I said, listen, you asked me to marry with this man, but he doesn't know the Lord. You're going to cry your heart out. I don't want to marry you to. No, no, but this and this and this is the reason. I said, he's going to break your heart. He's not following the Lord, and you should, if you marry, marry in the Lord. And then people will, you know, sometimes say, um, they will be hard-necked, and they will pursue their way, and then you marry them, and three years later they in the divorce court. They wouldn't listen. And you warn them, and you say to them, the Bible is very clear, be careful when you get involved in a relationship. If you are a believer and you get in a relationship with an unbeliever, uh, it can be big heartaches for you. That's why the Lord says, you know, make your decision in life because you're going to pay a price. But what is really touching for me is 1 John 3 verse 1 to 3 where the Bible clearly says that we do not know because we are children of God there's things that we do not know but we are children of God and we know what we do know when he appears we will be and shall be like him for we shall see him Jesus as he is and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure so I want to call on you and say to you if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, He's the Holy Son of God, and He's coming back for you, you need to get your life straightened out so that you follow Him to purify yourself, to have a clean, holy life, 
to live to God a life of separation. When the Bible says you are set apart, all what the Bible means is you do not belong to the devil, to sin, and to the world. All what it actually means is you belong to God. Behave like somebody that belongs to God. You know, if you're a married man, behave like a married man. If you're a married woman, behave like a married woman. If you belong to God, behave like you belong to God. You can't behave like you're a friend of the devil or the friend of the world. So you're either that or you're not. So if you are bound to the Lord, if you are set apart to the Lord, this is how we live our life. This is the life of a true Christian. And it doesn't mean you can't have joy and you can't go to the beach and you can't have fun. Of course you can have all of that. But it's always in the back of your mind, you always know, I belong to the Lord. That is what it means when you say, I am holy to the Lord. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless.